haunted hotels, or at least an individual room in a hotel, seems to be getting more and more common nowadays. How much do you want to bet the prices on those particular rooms are more expensive than the others? It would be easy enough to write off a lot of those accounts as marketing ploys, especially with the little historical evidence to back up those claims. What's worse than that are the generic run-of-the-mill stories behind some of those hauntings. The lady in white, the jilted lover, some random former employee that just loved their job so much they just won't leave. Stories like that are all over the place. So, how did the Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs, Arkansas make the cut? Well, there's history there, that's for sure. We have the ghost of a construction worker from when the hotel was first built. Of course, there's the ghost of former employees wandering the halls and the spirits of previous guests. But there also seems to be a portal, some say. And why would a portal be at the Crescent Hotel? Well, the portal sits on top of the morgue, of course. That's right, the morgue. There was a time that the Crescent Hotel operated as a hospital. The Baker Cancer Curing Hospital. It was ran by a con man. Someone that wasn't even a doctor. And the morgue was needed for those less fortunate souls that fell for his con. There we go. That got my attention. Let's see what all we can find out about the self-build most haunted hotel in America. Everyone loves a good, strange, weird, or bizarre story. Well, welcome to the American South, where dark legends and haunted history lurk around every corner. Where superstition, folklore, and a touch of backwoods magic blend with everyday culture, some say, in order to survive. This is Dixie After Dark. Deep in the Ozark Mountains sits the little town of Eureka Springs, Arkansas, also known as the Magic City, or Little Switzerland. The population of Eureka Springs is a little over 2,000 people, but it is a massive tourist destination due to its Victorian-era appeal. What brought people here in the 19th century, though, was the tales of healing springs in the area. Well before settlers arrived in the Ozarks, native tribes had legends of a great healing spring in the area that later became known as Eureka Springs. The first European settlers in the area believed in the healing properties of the springs as well, describing the waters as having, quote, magical powers. History credits Dr. Alva Jackson with locating the major spring there and claimed in 1856 that the waters cured him of eye problems. During the American Civil War, Dr. Jackson converted a cave into a makeshift hospital and primarily used the waters from Basin Springs to treat the wounded. After the war was over, he began marketing the spring water as Dr. Jackson's eye water. In 1879, a friend of Dr. Jackson, Judge J.B. Saunders, made the claim that a crippling disease of his was cured by the same waters. Saunders told anyone that would listen about the miraculous waters, and word started to spread, creating a boom town. The surrounding land became covered with tents and makeshift shelters. On February 14, 1880, Eureka Springs was incorporated as a city. Within a year, Eureka Springs was Arkansas's fourth largest city, and by 1889, the state's second largest city. While the city grew at warp speed, 
businesses began popping up to capitalize on the resort feel of the area due to the amount of people coming and going, looking to get some of the healing waters from the springs. Between 1882 and 1884, Eureka Springs became more easily accessible with the completion of a railroad, and the city was now cemented as a vacation destination. One of the first major resort locations built in Eureka Springs was the Crescent Hotel, construction beginning in 1884 on a 27-acre piece of land overlooking the valley. It is the initial construction of the hotel that gives us our first legend of a ghost tied to the site. The most often cited spirit at the Crescent Hotel is one that the staff have named Michael. According to stories, Michael was one of the original stonemasons during the original construction. While working on the roof, Michael lost his balance and fell to his death to the second floor area. This spot is now the location of room 218, said to be the hotel's most active haunted room. Michael is said to be a mischievous spirit. He tends to play with the lights, doors, and television. He's also known to pound on the walls. Some say they have witnessed hands reaching out from them from the bathroom window, or heard Michael scream as if he was falling from the roof again. Others claim to be shaken awake during the night, or even see Michael, described by all as a red-headed Irishman. Construction continued, though, and was ultimately completed. The cost of the building was $294,000, a ton of money for the 1800s. The majority of the material used was local limestone, a material we've talked about in a previous video for the alleged ability to store energies of past events, leading to future hauntings. On May 20th, 1886, the Crescent Hotel was officially opened for business. At the time, it was called America's most luxurious resort hotel. People from all across the country flocked to the fancy resort for its furnishings, the 500-person dining room, swimming pools, tennis courts, gardens and boardwalks, and a stable of 100 horses. The largest attraction for the guests, though, was the healing waters of the area's springs. However, after the turn of the century, people began to realize that the healing springs weren't producing the magical claims of the hotel and city. Within ten years, the Crescent Hotel went from lavish gatherings to financial struggle. In 1908, the building was converted to the Crescent College and Conservatory for Young Women, but continued as a resort location in the summers. Ultimately, this change could not save the business, though, and it was closed in 1924. The Crescent Hotel sat abandoned for six years, before being briefly reopened as a junior college from 1930 to 1934. In 1937, though, a man by the name of Norman Baker arrived. He bought the empty Crescent Hotel and converted it to a cancer hospital, naming it the Baker Cancer Curing Hospital. Leaning on the previous craze of the supposed healing properties of the springs from decades earlier, Baker promised patients would walk away from the new hospital cancer-free without surgery or painful treatments. The sick flocked to the Ozarks from all over, most of them desperate from the failures of previous treatments. On top of treating patients at the hospital, Baker also sold his elixirs through the mail to people all over the country. People from all over suddenly found themselves with hope. What they didn't have, however, was the easy means of research like we do today. If they did, 
A quick background search would have let patients know that Norman Baker's treatments were nothing more than a scam, one he had taken with him on his travels. Norman Baker had no medical license whatsoever. As a matter of fact, he had already been previously convicted in Iowa a year earlier for practicing medicine without a license, and the American Medical Association had condemned the different elixirs he had already previously sold. His work in Eureka Springs and boldness to move to mail-order treatments ended up being his downfall. In 1939, he was finally arrested for mail fraud the U.S. Post Office estimating that Baker had made as much as $500,000 a year off of his supposed elixirs from Eureka Springs. He was sentenced to four years in Leavenworth Penitentiary, eventually being released in 1944. Norman Baker then moved to Florida to live out the rest of his days. It is estimated that at least 300 patients checked into Norman Baker's hospital, only to become unaccounted for later. No one knows for sure what happened to these people, but it was discovered by historians that Baker would forge letters to family members of patients that were already deceased, pretending to be them, asking for more money. In 2019, Landscapers uncovered over 500 bottles and jars containing partial human remains, a bone saw, as well as old 16mm film where a few images were able to be recovered. Today, there have been sightings of a nurse pushing a gurney down the halls of the floor that contained the morgue of Baker's supposed hospital. When the nurse reaches the end of the hallway, she vanishes into thin air. Visitors or staff that have not seen her for themselves still report the sounds of a squeaky gurney being pushed down the hallway. These reports only happen after 11 o'clock at night, seemingly coinciding with the hospital's old schedule. Bodies would only be transported to the morgue late at night, as not to upset or bring unwanted attention of the other patients or visiting family members. Interestingly enough, the Crescent Hotel still houses Norman Baker's old autopsy table, as well as the walk-in freezer that was once utilized in the morgue. Also, in the area that has been converted to the laundry area for the Crescent Hotel, a maintenance worker once reported that the washer and dryer sometimes turned themselves on in the middle of the night. The apparition of Norman Baker himself has been reported by some visitors either in the basement or at the foot of the first floor stairway. He seems to always be seen in a white suit with a purple shirt. The basement floor contained Baker's personal offices and before it was removed, the antique phone switchboard continuously received phantom phone calls from the empty basement, the same location where his patients were ultimately convinced to pay for his supposed treatments. There is also a spirit that identifies herself as Theodora. She is mostly seen in room 419. She is overall a nice and courteous spirit, always introducing herself as a cancer patient before vanishing from sight. After its stint as a supposed hospital, the Crescent Hotel found itself empty once again and stayed that way until 1946 when it was purchased by a group of businessmen from Chicago. They set about to restore the Crescent Hotel to its former glory and in doing so, the hotel started to thrive again. But in 1967, a fire raged through the fourth floor of the South Wing and much of it was destroyed. The hotel passed through several owners over the next few years, each one with dreams of fully restoring the hotel to once it once was, but it never quite happened. 
It wasn't until 1997 that the new owners pledged to the people of Eureka Springs that the hotel would be fully restored to its former glory of a hundred years earlier. Most people had written them off, as this was something they had been hearing time and time again. But the new owners stuck to their pledge. This time, fate seemed to smile on the new endeavor, and on September 6, 2002, the Crescent Hotel reopened its doors, fully restored, after a multi-year project and $5 million in renovations. Today, the Crescent Hotel is one of the most visited hotels in the South. Some visitors come for its old world elegance, others for its strange history and paranormal happenings. Other than those already outlined, there are a lot of other spirits known at the Crescent Hotel. Many of its guests and staff from its bygone Victorian era seem to remain there. A man in formal Victorian dress, complete with a top hat, is known to linger around the lobby or at the bar. Witnesses describe him as distinguished looking, with a full beard. Many people try to engage him with conversation, thinking he's on the staff and in costume. The man always stays quiet, but seems intrigued by the guest's effort, only to disappear when it would be his turn to respond. Many spirits have been reported in the main dining room. A full troop of 1890s dressed dancers have been seen, dancing away in the early morning hours. Others report a single man, again in Victorian clothes, sitting along a table near the window. He's known to tell guests, I saw the most beautiful woman here last night, and I am waiting for her return. The reflection of a Victoria-era bride and groom has also been seen in the large mirror in the dining room. The image of the couple always seems to vanish after the groom makes eye contact with you. None of the dining room spirits seem to be vengeful or hateful in any way. In fact, staff describe them as playful. On one event in particular, the dining room had been decorated for the Christmas season. When staff arrived the next morning, the Christmas tree had been moved from one side of the room to the other, and all of the chairs had been arranged in a semicircle facing the tree. There have been various other reports of ghosts of children skipping through the hotel, as well as waiters and other staff from days gone by. Apart from the ghost of Michael in room 218, rooms 202 and 424 are reported to have ghostly activity as well. Some point to the existence of the old morgue as the source of all the hauntings, while others point to the sheer amount of limestone used in the construction of the place as the source. Regardless of which is which, visitors all agree that the spirits are there and they seem to have been embraced and are welcomed, not only by the Crescent Hotel, but by the residents of Eureka Springs themselves. Naturally, the Halloween season has become the busiest holiday of the year in Eureka Springs. The weekend before Halloween, the city hosts the annual Eureka Springs Zombie Crawl, one of the largest zombie parades in the country. The city is also home to the Nightmare and Ozarks Film Festival, which also takes place in October. Now, this is a place I have to visit before long. Even if I don't experience anything paranormal, it's just the history behind the place that would be something to experience. With 15 acres of gardens and nature trails, 72 guest rooms, and 12 suites on top of the history behind this place, who knows who or what someone visiting may experience. <laughs>